Hierdie is, sê dit, soos dit is. Two. Kop 28 is currently taking place in Dubai. What is Kop uh, 28 doing? And what is the main aim? And I'm asking you just, just for the benefit of somebody that doesn't know. It's the Conference of Parties, Gerard. It is a global meeting of governments and civil society. And they discuss ways to uh, make sure that the earth, the, that global warming does not uh, increase by more than 1.5 or lately they've moved the target to 2 degrees because they firmly believe that mankind has a role to play um, in working against global warming. Um, it is seen as a possible catastrophe um, and a lot of the discussions at the COP is actually about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But there's also a lot of emphasis on how to adapt to global warming. So this is the 28th such a meeting. There's, it, it happens once a year, actually twice a year, because there's also in, during May always a, a SAPSTA meeting in Bonn because that's where the UNFCCC is based, the United Nations Agency working on climate change. Um, but that's more or less where all the planning and, and, and the bureaucracy um, is doing their deliberations. And then it flows over to this conference of parties, which is the political discussions around it. And, and this is also where um, they try every year to push um, new agreements between nations and between countries on um, how to go about to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and how to prioritize funding, especially in the global south, in third world countries, to make these countries more resilient uh, against the, the, the changing of the climate. Okay. Do you, um, is it a global warming dilemma or is it a so-called global warming dilemma? Well, it, it all depends on the, the period over which you refer uh, because the, the planet's climate has never been stable. For millennia and millennia, we went through warmer and colder cycles. We've had global warming before, and we've had global freezing before. And our ancient history is actually driven by these changes in the climate. That the climate is changing, that is so. You, you, you only need to ask any farmer. The climate is changing. You might remember, especially there where you grew up in the northern free state, when we were children, we still had this Gilparskerien. Two weeks of soft drizzle, and I can't remember when last I've experienced that. Um, so the, the climate is changing all the time. The big question is, what is the role of mankind in bringing about these changes? Can we stop it? Um, and the narrative at the COP, and I've attended every COP since 2011, um, the narrative at this COP is that we are the culprits, that mankind is driving these changes because of industrialization and because of the way we produce, whether it is in our food systems or whether it is in our energy sector, whether it is in our um, transport sectors or manufacturing. Um, and the... The biggest part of this debate, or the let me rather rephrase and say the most sensitive part of this debate, is that the global south is kind of saying to the global north, the poor part of the world is saying to the rich part of the world, we got where we are now because of your using 
fossil fuels, coal and oil, to build your economies, to become wealthy nations. And now we are paying the price for it. So kind of you, you owe us now. Um, now you must pay for us who are suffering because of it. Um, but that does not answer the question whether we are actually uh, the reason why the climate is changing. Um, because even though many of our industries are certainly putting more fossil fuels in the atmosphere than what is healthy for, 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 for the atmosphere or for the planet, even though um, pollution is taking its toll, one volcanic eruption puts more of those gases and especially carbon into the atmosphere than anything mankind could ever have done. For us as farmers, the big issue is the methane debate. What's the role of cattle in uh, changing the climate? Um, and this is, of course, where the sparks are flying. This is what 70 farmers are doing right now in Dubai, taking part in the debates and bringing the data to the table and the science, asking all the most difficult questions. Because you would have noticed that the politics of the ne Netherlands is really in turmoil at the moment. Farmers took to the streets because the Netherlands government actually passed legislation to reduce the number of cattle, believing that it is the methane emissions from cattle that is the most potent greenhouse gas. We have too many cattle. We should reduce our cattle, which actually means a reduction of animal-based proteins in our diets, and specifically cattle, because cattle are uh, ruminants. They, 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 they are for stomachs, and in the first stomach, the, the grass they eat is broken down to be digestible in the second stomach. And in this um, fermentation, in, in, in the first stomach, um, one of the byproducts is methane gas, which is actually emitted through the mouths of cattle. And, and so it is for, 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 the, for the time that Earth exists, that's how it was, that's how it is, and that is important. From the, the time ruminants exist. Yeah. That's, that is important for the future existence of earth that's part of this thing and yeah. the man is so clever he wants to exclude that out of this cycle yeah you know the the methane cycle is a very short cycle 10 to 12 years methane is a lighter gas it goes up into the atmosphere um, and there in about 10 to 12 years it breaks down into mainly two elements carbon and water and both comes down to the surface again. The one has precipitation, as rain. The other gets sequestrated by the very grass on which the animals feed, on which they graze. And because they graze the grass, they stimulate new growth, more photosynthesis, more sequestration of the carbon, putting it through the roots where it should be, under the soils. So this cycle goes on and on. And you can really not compare that to the cycle over millennia where fossil fuels, that, that is the carbon of plants which died millions of years ago when the Earth's atmosphere was dominated by carbon. And it's through this plant action that the carbon is sequestrated in the soils and then laid down as the fossil fuels, oil and coal. And now today we unearth it again, we burn it again and put it back into the atmosphere. This is not the same as the short-lived cycle of ruminants. So as farmers, we are saying, we are questioning the signs behind this narrative that cattle is actually driving climate change. But according to them, there are other drivers of climate change. I understand... Uh, 
um, uh, the, uh, the, the role of uh, the problem that they've identified within the industrialization of the world. T typical, the debate of the southern part of the world saying to the northern guy, you made your money and you built your industries and now that you've, you're happy, you identified, well, we've got a problem. Now you must fall in. But that type of uh, pollution, let's call it that, is that a problem in climate change? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is for sure that we must rethink the way our action in big industry is impacting on nature, on biodiversity, on life on Earth, and on the health of our planet. That is so. There is no way we can just shy away from that responsibility. The question is about the science, the data, pinpointing the problem and addressing the real issues. For sure, we must reduce pollution. Um, for sure, we must reduce the, the use of fossil fuels because it's a limited source. We will ultimately run out of that. Uh, apart from the fact that it is a limited source, is it harmful to nature? I've been in Beijing where on a particular day you almost can't see the sun. Now, uh, they need to feed 1.3 billion people. And one way of doing that is through the industries. And the industries burn fuel. But is it harmful to nature what they're doing? Is it harmful? Uh, or does does no, is, is nature in any way affected by this? For sure, for sure, pollution cannot be good for nature, hey? But then, the debate does not stop there. The debate is demonizing carbon. And actually, we are carbon. <laughs> carbon is nearly in everything around us. It's one of the most basic building blocks of the physical world around us. We cannot demonize a carbon. What we can do is we can rethink the carbon cycle. Carbon is healthy when it is in the soils. We need it there. But remember, plants actually enjoy more carbon. It takes up carbon and in the process it produces oxygen was it not for that process we would not have existed we exist because there is now enough oxygen in the mix um, it is it is animals who does it the other way around we utilize the oxygen and we release carbon and it is to to maintain that balance you see when this debate started 28 years ago, it started in Japan. It started with an agreement between nations, not nearly as many as now, but the original group of nations got together at, in, in the city of Kyoto. And they got to an agreement that they are working, they will work towards a more climate-friendly environment across the globe. And they signed a protocol, a contract with each other on how to do it. Now, few people go back to that protocol to read that. You will not find the world agriculture in there, or farming, or food systems. Yeah. There was nothing about that. Nothing. Fifteen years later, in Paris, the, at the Paris Agreement, the, the word was sneaked in. And actually, as farmers' organizations, we fought for that. We said, also spare a thought for the farmers who need to survive and produce surpluses under this dispensation. But it only referred to food security. 
whatever this agreement entails should not impact on food security. So, uh, sorry, that was COP20, that was in Paris in 2015. Then, all of a sudden, in Katowice, in Poland, I think it was in 2018, all hell broke loose for farmers. All of a sudden, farmers were made out to be the main culprits in emissions. We, we were blamed for 28% of all the emissions. And when we looked at the numbers, we said, whoa, not, not 28% of the emissions come from farms. Maybe it comes from the food system. But the food system is much broader than our farms because they've also put the logistics on our bill. The energy that goes with refrigeration and cooling on our bill, it should go to the bill of transport and energy. It's not about what happens on the farm. What happens on the farm is some mechanization, plowing, disking, is the methane from our ruminants, not all livestock from our ruminants. And in any way, what is the alternative? For them, and in much of the de debates at COP, the alternative is plant-based proteins. Replace your cattle with plant-based proteins. But they don't say what exactly is the carbon footprint of producing that monocropping in yellow beans or soya beans. How many more tractors must run over how many millions of more hectares to pr produce the beans to be processed into alternative meat? What is the carbon footprint of that processing? It reminds me of a debate in which I took part um, in, 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 in Scotland two years ago, where this big multinational coffee franchise said, we no longer use any sugar in our coffee. Our alternative sugar is actually sourced in uh, Latin America. And then we process it in China before we use it in New York in the coffee shop. But what is the carbon footprint of that transporting and that processing? You know, what, what sense does it make? Does the numbers add up? And hence, the strategy of the farmers is to push for the real numbers. Give us the data. We want evidence-based policies around this. And we are prepared to say, okay, if, if the scientific evidence shows us the red card, then we must get off the field. But this is not supported by the data as it is now. We have only one um, source for our ammunition in this battle. And this is science, real science. And then we have only two weapons. And that is scientific facts and solid arguments. And we feel in the battle, ours have not been matched as yet. Is this debate uh, at COP and the universal debate about climate change? Um, and I say, when I talk climate change, I want to say so-called climate change. I've seen the climate changed. You've talked about the the rain, the the um, Hilperskerian. Hilperskerian. Uh, I remember in the northeastern Free State where I grew up, that December months was the time for harvesting wheat, quera. And then it disappeared because the the the, the raining season has 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 changed totally. They couldn't do any more. They couldn't. There was just no time anymore to, to, to plant wheat and the market has changed, etc. So we see that. We see this huge heat wave that we experience 
now as we speak. But that's something that's come and gone through the ages. Uh, so is this debate hijacked? Yes, it is hijacked. It is hijacked mostly by big corporates. It is hijacked by people who can, who has the capacity to centralize power and capital in our food systems. It is hijacked by people who can make a lot of money by radically changing some production lines. Um, and the heat of the debate is mostly around that. For us as farmers, and I've, I'm yet to, to meet a farmer who does not love nature, who would not bend backwards yeah. to enhance nature. Yeah. We live too close to her, not to love her. But to, to make the farmers out as the main culprits driving climate change and saying, we need to change our production systems, move away from animal-based proteins. We must, uh, we must reduce our use of fertilizer and agrochemicals. We must hand a portion of our production lands back to nature, more or less the size of Latin America. But we need to feed 2 billion more mouths. The numbers does not add up. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. In real life, how do you do that? So just follow the money. Mm. See who benefits most from these radical steps which are proposed in the side events of COP. Mm. Um, and what will then happen to those who are in the conventional food systems at this stage? I have often at COP lashed out at the NGOs and the big corporates who are preaching all over Africa that we should not use synthetic fertilizers, that we should move away from agrochemicals, that we should not mechanize our agriculture, not turn the soils. Saying, I cannot believe that people would spend a lifetime working to keep our farmers poor. And certain countries did go that route, apart now from the Netherlands who are paying a dear price politically for it. But for example, in Southeast Asia, this debate is also very much heated up. So Sri Lanka at one stage said, we will move towards um, organic farming only. But they did it only for one season. You see, nine months later, they said, see, it's working. Everything is still in place because they still ate last season's food. And then all of a sudden, the production numbers took a nosedive. And this happened during COVID. So they said, whoa, there's no way we can feed a nation. Just as there is no way we can feed the world today. What to say, two billion more people in the next 30 years through organic production. It's wonderful to have organic production. But you must know that your yields are lower. Damage yeah. because of insects yeah. are much higher. And like only yesterday in a Zoom meeting with people who are now at COP, and who said to me, but why don't we switch in terms of protein production, animal production? Why don't we switch to free range? Yeah. Surely. You can do what you are doing today uh, in terms of the production of chickens and eggs. Yeah. You can do it with free range. I said, we can. The farmers of the world can feed the world through free range chicken and eggs. But the world cannot afford yeah. to buy it yeah. from us. It will cost too much for the poorer and the middle class to buy it from us. 
Yeah. So, you know, nobody wants to deliberately pollute the world. Well, there might be people that doesn't care, but everybody cares. But uh, we we need to adopt a pragmatic approach. And that's what we ask of the globalists who wants to tell us how we must conduct our affairs. They make money out of this thing. There's only profit to be, to be made here. The whole approach and the the response to the dilemma which they uh, say that exists. We say we must have a pragmatic approach and not an ideological approach towards climate change. What is it that we can do that is taking everything into consideration? The best thing to do. Gerard, there are two parts to this answer. The one is a we need a farmers driven approach. And the second is that the answer is in the soils. All over COP, they always say on a very practical level, what the farmers need to change is how they work the soil like no till or minimum tillage, ripping through the soil instead of turning the soil. Because by turning it, you release all that carbon that's been sequestrated in the last season or two. Yeah, It's about how we do fertigation or irrigation, how we use our fertilizers and our agrochemicals. It's all about what we do in the soils. And healthy soils need less fertilizer needs less agrochemicals. It's about that life in the soils. The answer is always about how we work the soil. Now, unfortunately, the climate debate is highly politicized. When you talk about climate smart agriculture in the USA, the farmers hear politics. They hear Al Gore. Yeah. And they shy away from it. When you talk climate smart agriculture in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, the farmers have the same attitude. They say, if I do everything by the book, but my neighbor does nothing, the net impact will be nothing. And I suspect that my neighbor is not going to bring his part, so why should I go to the, the trouble to do it? Because the climate covers us all. But the soils have not been politicized. Hence, from our side, as a network for family farmers here in South Africa, in SAI, and with a large number of similar organizations, national farmers' organizations elsewhere in the world, we are trying to shift the focus to the soils, saying, let's rather see how we can peer-to-peer -peer, hold each other responsible and accountable for what we do with our soils. Actually, in Sai, we started this campaign on healthy soils, articulating our dreams on half a page of commitment. In my case, I will sign an agreement with all other farmers out there that I, Theodor Jager, on my farm, Red Bank in Tenin, will ensure that I pass on this farm in a healthier condition to the next generation than what I found it. And if 10% of the world's farmers can do that, by simply taking care of the health in the soils, we can really hit a dent in the problem of biodiversity and climate too. Because you see, the soils go nowhere. What I invest in my soils, I have the direct benefit of it, not my neighbor, unless the topsoil washes away to him because of poor management practices on my side. So rather than talking about climate smart agriculture and getting involved in the politics of it, we say rather, let's get to this peer-to-peer -peer agreement. And we want to end up with a kind of a sticker 
on our products to say, I'm part of this global network of farmers who are really taking care of, of our soils. So on a practical level, this is what we can do. And that's why ever since Katowice, ever since 2018, as World Farmers Organization, we brought in this initiative we call Climakers, which entailed workshops in every corner of the world, in the Caribbean, on small islands in the Pacific, in Oceania, the young farmers of Europe, in Southern Africa with the Southern African Confederation of Agricultural Unions, having workshops asking these two questions. What can I do on my farm to adapt to a changing climate and also to mitigate? And secondly, what will it take, or will it take to get it done? Knowing that the answers we get from Southern Africa will be different from the answers in Latin America, will be different to the answers in the Caribbean or the Pacific. To have a tailor-made solution for every region and then take those answers to the UNFCCC and to COP and say, this is what the farmers believe their contribution can, can, can be. Now the ball is in your court. For example, going back to my first argument that farmers can very efficiently move from turning the soils to just ripping through the soils. But in practical terms, if I have paid for the last 10 years every year my installment on a plow to turn the soils, and now I have a plow, I don't have a ripper, it would make a lot of sense to spend part of the budget on climate change rather to subsidize a farmer to change his plow to a ripper. Do you, I just want to take you back. Uh, to something that you've mentioned. You say that the farmers of the world can uh, um, uh, provide the world with uh, free-range chickens. They can, but the people cannot afford to pay for it. Just explain that. What, what, what are you saying? Just explain that. You see, in a battery where you have layers, uh, chickens laying eggs every day, Everything is automated, whether it's the feed, the water, even the harvesting. Those egg is being laid, it runs into a, a, a groove, and then it runs um, to the production line where it is packed, wrapped, distributed. And you don't miss an egg. Everything is automatic. You have proper quality control and you will close to never have a bad egg on your tray when you buy it from shelves and shops. But when you have free range, you must go and look for those eggs. You will not find all of them. <laughs> you might find that egg two or three weeks later. And now it might be close to, uh, to, to, to being what a chicken. What a point of guard to follow each chicken, huh? <laughs> It's yeah, in. The, the, the whole process is less controllable. You cannot control what they eat. You cannot control what they drink. Um, you cannot do disease management as well as you can do it in, 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 in batteries. Um, the same goes with pigs, with pork production. So you, it, it's doable, but it's very expensive. Yeah. Do you, a last word, very short one. Uh, where is the debate going? You know, to predict the future, just look at the past. We started off with an agreement which was science-based in the Kyoto Protocol and agriculture was not there. Then came the Paris Agreement and food security kind of sneaked in by the skin of its teeth and now, agriculture and food systems is really mainstream in this debate. The topic of this COP in Dubai is agriculture and food systems. Could the scientists have been so wrong a mere 28 years ago or eight years ago in Paris? And what new will the, science, 
scientists come up with. Yeah. As as farmers, we cannot just change our pra practices. Everything, e every time the the policymakers change their mood, at COP. So, I think where this thing is going, is that certain industry bodies, global industry bodies, such as the banks, such as the um, the whole insurance industry, which is also based on data, on climate. If there's a big hailstorm, a fire, a drought, floods, they pick up a part of the bill for it in the insurance industry. But also in the World Farmers Organization, we will start to put stronger and stronger pressure on policymakers to come up with more sustainable policies mm. without hampering either the profitability or the sustainability of production on farms. And farmers have started to push back, saying no one is as vulnerable than us to climate change. And we accept that we can do something about it, but then it must make sense to us. The numbers must add up. And if it does not make sense, we will just let it go by. Thank you, too. Um, um, just to uh, mention, uh, too, you are the ambassador of the World Farmers uh, Association organization at COP. How many COP meetings have you attended of the 28? I've attended every one since 2011. So yeah. this would have been... Your 12th one. No. The 13th one. My 14th, 2011, 14th. must be included. A, a 14th one. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, sorry, 13th. Yeah, yeah, it would yeah, have yeah. been my 13th yeah, yeah. one. Um, you're, so, you're a farmer. You're not good with maths. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the back of my cigarette <laughs> box with me. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, unfortunately, this time I could not get a, a new passport. My passport is full. Yeah. Uh, you need one open page at least to be able to travel. And I've been struggling now for more than two weeks to get a, a new passport. So I passed this um, opportunity on to one of the other board members of, of SAI. But I'm very much involved digitally in the debates yeah. there. And um, only yesterday I've written four speeches for, for farmers who are taking part on that level. Um, but th this is typically where the value of an uh, organization focused on advocacy becomes clear. There is an opportunity in the global debate for the farmers to have their voice heard too. And then it takes these two things, scientific facts and logical arguments to make sure that you push the policymakers into um, a direction where our industry does not get hurt. Just a last remark from my, my side. Uh, somebody listening to this might say, but this is a farmer's debate. It is not a farmer's debate. It, although it is, it's not only a farmer's debate. If the globalist dealing, handling of the so-called climate uh, change uh, um, dilemma uh, doesn't deal with this properly, you will have poverty and food insecurity all over the world. So we're all involved in what's currently happening. Yeah, you know, in the global north and even here in South Africa, we've not dealt with hunger since the Second World War. And if you've not seen hunger in your life, <laughs> you won't understand the impact of it. Because what is being proposed might well lead to food insecurity. Although, as we sit here, 50% of South, Africa, South Africans already experience food insecurity, as it is. That's on a household level. Yeah, yeah. It's not on a national level. We have enough food in South Africa. Oh, yeah, well, the no, no, no. problem is that the food is not where the people are, well, exactly. and it costs too much to get it there. Well, but 50% of people have is does not necessarily know every day that they have enough food for today, every day of the year. And with the moment you do not have that, 
you suffer from food insecurity. Tew, thank you very much. What a pleasure.